If you're watching this wondering what this is, this is a BMW Z8, a car which came out over 20 years ago and still to this day is probably quite a misunderstood, um, hardly seen car. I've never actually driven one, so the point of this video is for me to finally get behind the wheel of this, a chap called Tony who's letting me drive his car, and try and get an idea of what on earth BMW were thinking when they came up with it. It's a very expensive, odd, quirky but very classy car and if you watch the James Bond film in 1999 that's probably the first time like me that you got a chance to see this the world is not enough or maybe it is I don't know anyway I'm Johnny Smith welcome to the late break show Okay, Tony, so explain to me why, why this car, because this is a, this is a very rare groove, m misunderstood car. And I've, the reason why I wanted to do this, the drive of this, because selfishly, I've never driven one, I'd like to drive one. So I've heard they're quite yeah. unique. Yeah. And I know there's loads of weird things. We'll go through some of the weird features if we can. Why did you want one? I think the attraction of this car, it's just because of what it is, I think. I mean, it is a beautiful looking car yeah. and iconic in many ways, whether it's James Bond or whatever. Yeah, they, they didn't make many of them. 5,000, was it? Yeah. So made in between 2000 and 2003 and they made 5,703. Yeah. Yeah. And 555 Alpinas. Yeah. Uh, it's a five liter engine, V five liter V8 engine. Yeah. Uh, so I love V8s and... The, there aren't many BMWs that have this sort of quality class and everything else. I mean, BMWs are very, very good cars, don't get me wrong, but this, this is just something that's just a bit different. And it's an M car as well. Yeah, well, that's weird. It's almost like it's a relaxing M car, from what yeah. I've been told. It's not mad. It's not got a limited slip diff. It's not really tough suspension, I don't think. So it's like a comfortable, it's like an M cruiser. Yeah, I mean, I saw this one for sale and I thought, Price is okay, it wasn't cheap, but it was, it was, the price was okay. But it's got Alpina suspension on it, it's got the uh, cross brace on the engine, yeah. uh, so it's, it's, it's been nicely breathed on. Uh, they got a little bit of bad press when they first came out because they designed the tyres for the, sorry, the suspension for normal sort of tyres, and then they put run flat tyres on. Right. And run flats, as we know, are not the best ride, and right. they upset the whole car handling and everything else. Yeah. So, well, I got this with the Alpina suspension, and it ran very, very nicely on the standard wheels. Yeah. So I thought, well, you've got Alpina suspension, I need Alpina wheels. And the That's... Alpina wheels and yeah. tires, are the, the larger diameter, they've gone from 18 to 20 inch, I think, is yeah. it? Yeah, 20s, uh, which were massive. 20 inch, which are big wheels. And usually I don't like very low profile wheels because I think the, the, all it does is make the, the ride more yes. uncomfortable yeah. and you don't really gain a lot. I mean, the touring car that I drove, that didn't have you know, low profile tires. The profile on the touring car and all my race cars, the profile's higher on that. So why put you know, rubber band around, a, around an aluminium wheel, it doesn't make sense. Yeah. You know, all it does is make the, the ride a lot worse. But this ride is better with these wheels and the car drives better. I don't know why, don't ask me, but obviously maybe the suspension's made for the yeah. wheels and everything else. But yeah, it's a lovely car and, and wherever you go with it, everyone goes, wow, I've never seen one of those before. So yeah. that's what it's about. So the styling on this was, and you can see the bonnet's massive and the the cabin's right at the back with a stubby boot. This was styled around the 507 yes. from the 50s, which was like yeah. a really exclusive... And they made about 200 of those. Was it 200 I, of those or I know, Well, I know there wasn't a lot of them. It was a very, very, very rare car. And they're bringing over a million now. Yeah. 
They're so this serious, was this yeah. was their sort of like yeah. pre millennium version yeah. of that yeah. car with the with the gills. Yeah, There's you, chrome on it, which yeah. at the time was an unusual feature because yeah. it. You've got to remember when this car came out in 2000, it predated just about the BMW Mini, yeah. which was very much a retro car, yeah. which had these sorts of features on. Yeah. It predated the Fiat 500 as a retro. We didn't really have retro car, style cars then. So it was before its time, styled by uh, Henrik Fisker, who went on to make the Fisker Karma, if you remember that car, the weird electric yeah. car. Again, way before its time. These features here were very much um, 507. And I, I didn't realize until I read up on it just before this shoot that those are full beam. Those light inboard lights right. in the grills. Oh, like, I didn't know that. I thought they were <laughs> fog lights and it doesn't yeah. actually have fog lights at the front. Right. It only has fogs at the back. Yeah. So the Z8 went on sale in 2000. This was when Chris Bangle was heading up the design studios of, of BMW and this particular car was designed by Henrik Fisker who had a very distinct um, design taste and that design taste you can also see in a car that he designed uh, by his own company called Fisker, the Fisker Karma. You might not remember it, an electric car that uh, was very ahead of its time actually. I mean, not a really, really quick car, I don't think, um, for its time. 4.9 4 to 62. So even fourth gear, 2,000 RPM. Lovely stream of torque. It's so creamy. It really is. And the steering wheel's thin-rimmed, soft leather no buttons apart from an actual horn the ride is very good as tony said i think they probably got unfairly judged because of the run flat tires that bmw were opting for on a lot of models tiny bit of scuttle sh shudder but not not much it feels pointy and, and and pleasantly narrow though, so I don't feel like it's pushing the full width of my lane on the road. And a lot of modern sports cars have that problem. They're just too big for the road. Bury the throttle at 3,000. It's not like a real sledgehammer at all, but it's smooth. It is a smooth operator, this. I'm really enjoying it. I didn't think I would enjoy it. I didn't think I'd fully understand it. And whilst I still don't love the, the look of it, certainly from the front, I love the fact that it was built just because they wanted to build it. Was there a market for it? Well, very exclusive. Do you know what I like about it? It's the fact that it's the it's the that beautiful flavour of of a rear rear mounted front engine, if you know what I mean, or rear midship. What do they call it? Where the V8 is pushed right back for good handling purposes. Rear wheel drive, three pedal car, no limited slip diff. You could never order this car with an LSD. Again, weird. As I drive through. Uh, the town now, Alderley Edge. You see there's so many quirks on the Z8 that I like. So all the heater controls and stuff, no words on them, very subtle. All this sort of satin brushed finish, um, aluminium, and they are all real aluminium from what I can tell. Look at the gauges, needles that are illuminated from the middle, unlike any other. The whole gauge pod in the middle, angled towards the driver. Really neat and unique. This pod is, of course, body coloured and wraps around like an amphitheatre, like no other. Then you've got the retro, almost, I think, looks like a steering wheel from a, an old power boat. Again, I think that's metal. So that key that sits up there, the key that's the same as all other BMW keys, just slim and quite humble, 
but with a, a screwed on plate that says Z8 on it. And that's where your phone lives, your clamshell uh, Motorola. People think this car is sort of related to the Z3, but I, I actually don't think it is at Nothing. all. Nothing. I don't think there's anything, is there? No. Apart from maybe yeah. the size, it seems Z3-ish in size. Yeah. I wrote down its, its dimensions because it's not a very big car. Yeah, 4,400 millimetres long, 1,830 mil wide, 1,300 mil high. It's not a big car yeah. at all. Not for 400 horse. Yeah. Five litre V8. You, but it's a bit like being in an E-Type, big long bonnet. Yeah. You, know, you do feel you've got a big long bonnet. You've got that thing you. out the front. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Some very neat little touches here. I mean, it's twenty over 20 years old, but it's as good as driving a brand new modern car. Well, that's the thing. I was thinking we're into 2023 now, so 20 years after production finished for yeah. this. Yeah, and it still looks, I think, very yeah. fresh. Almost, it looks better now than maybe when it first came out. Because yeah. maybe people get it now. Mm. Well, I think the, only, the the people who got this when when they were uh, new were all the film stars because all the film stars had them. Yeah, Sylvester Stallone. Oh yeah, the uh, yeah Brinkley, uh, the Christine Christine Brinkley is it? Yeah, yeah, she had one. Uh, this, this car was bought brand new by uh, Sir Michael Flatley. Sir Michael Flatley? Yeah, and he had a black one as well, which he had in Ireland, and this was the one he had in uh, the south of France, Villefranche in the south of France. So, River Dance Man. River Dance, yeah. He had yeah. two of them? Had two. That's amazing. Still one and a black one. Wow. Just to be different, he, so he must have really liked them. He must have really liked them, yeah. hasn't he? Yeah. yeah. As standard with, and I press this now, look. Hark, it has navigation, but it just has arrows down there and it's audible. So I can actually hear it. I've, I've set it to take me to my old, my old house in Chester, the first house I, I lived in when I got my first proper job. <laughs> it's trying to talk to me in German, of course. Look at, again, quirks. You twist this red knob, which I think uh, this red button is to do with the alarm. You twist it, and it makes a really audible clunking sound, and there's lights. The courtesy lights are in the base of this mirror. This is not really the best convertible weather, but I wanted to drive it with the roof down. But I apologise for the fact I've got the side windows up and the buffeting net up. That's purely for a recording point of view to get a clear sound of my voice. I don't normally like driving convertibles with the glass up because it looks a bit of a cop out, like you haven't fully committed. The steering's very, very stiff. Uh, not stiff, firm. And the gear shift, as with all manual BMWs, is sublime. Six speed. Really lovely clutch feel. In fact, all of the controls are just that pleasant BMW weight to them. And I love the fact it's a small car because on back roads, on British B roads, it fits. God, it's really nice to drive. This particular example has got like 10,000 miles on the clock, 16,900 kilometers. So it's a very low mileage car. This is probably now, this is probably now 220, 230,000 pounds. It's a lot of money on a car which at the time when it came out, I don't think it looked expensive. And that's what confused people. It didn't look like an expensive car. Definitely the greatest BMW M5 E39. Oh, what a car. 1582 kilos the Z8 weighed in at. I think if you're looking for a very intense, sort of like GT3 experience, 911 GT3, this is not that. Because this is a very comfortable car. Very, very comfortable and very refined. 
but yet with three pedals. And I reckon the three pedal element and the V8 element and the fact that it's an engineering obsession is what makes BMW Z8's depreciation proof. So this is actually the rear end of the Z8 is my favorite bit. It's very, very shallow kind of car. And it just, these, these sort of, almost E-type again, yeah. aren't yeah. they? Yeah, very much so. There is a lot of e, bits of E-type going on yeah. with this. And uh, the door handles as well, they've got these, and on, on the driver's side, one of the quirks is you can hinge up the outer portion to put a key in the door if you need oh, yeah, it. Yeah. Although it is a keyless entry car. Well, I didn't know that. Well, the, the, this, this, I think this car is full of things that you would, you can live with it for several years and probably not know some of them because the way the switches have been repurposed and um, and the fact it's got a push start which you can't push to start without turning the key. Yeah. And this was the this was the first car to have a push start modern car. And it has just taken four men fifteen minutes to work out how to put the headrest down. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you put the headrest up by just clicking it up, but it won't then go down. There's a hidden button. There's so many oddities, which is why I'm looking at this. One thing I didn't realise was that when it was in the film, the Bond film, The World Is Not Enough, which I, knew, I see you've got it written on the, Correct. On, on the number plate there, um, the car wasn't out yet. So the, the film came out in 99, the car came out in 2000. And when they were filming it, BMW hadn't actually finished making the car. So they didn't have oh, no. a finished car for right. Piers Brosnan to drive. So they supplied two sort of not quite finished cars for filming, which is where he drives it through an Azerbaijan oil field, yep. and then it gets sawn in half yep. in a beluga farm or uh, something like that. Yeah. It is odd that the Alpina versions used a different engine, the 4.8 from the BMW X5, so not an M engine, and they were automatic only. And the, I mean, it's- I don't get that. Again, it, it's just like, what? What is going on? Well, you lose power with an automatic transmission anyway. Yeah. And it's a smaller engine. And as somebody once said to me, there's no substitute for, for uh, CCs. For cubic inches, exactly. <laughs> and, and it's true. Yeah. I mean, th this, has, this has my favourite M5 engine. Yeah. The E39, um, which is a glorious thing. This doesn't have a standard exhaust on it, does it? No. Because these were quite quiet from the factory. Yeah. Again, one of those things where it was quite a mature car. Yeah. Quite subtle. Yeah. This is a Hammond, H-A-M-A-N-N, -N, I think. Ham oh, Hammond. Yeah, German tuner. Yes. H-A-M-A-N-N. -N. Yeah. So I've never heard of Hammond, but Hamann it's a exhaust. German, yeah, it's a German make, probably Aftermarket you know, special tuner. for this car. Yeah. In fact, another thing to bear in mind with this whole retro thing, LEDs weren't really seen on cars at this time in 2000, but both these lights, from what I remember, and the side indicators in these beautiful kind of tunneled in chrome areas, they were neon. They looked like neons. Very, very cool. And again, very expensive and totally unique to the car. I think there's no denying that a lot of people in the UK were put off by the fact it was left-hand drive only. But then some of the coolest cars that we've ever had have been left-hand drive only. Homologation stuff. This is not homologation, but... Look at the way the dash just wraps around you. It really cocoons you. As soon as you start to pick up speed, it does do what M BMW M cars do. Everything seems to kind of fit. It all starts to suddenly make sense and feel quite sinewy. Bloody gear shift's amazing. Beamer, Beamer, Beamer manuals are oh, just so nice. <laughs> I can see, I'm starting to get it. There's a little, a little bit of me that thinks, and don't take this the wrong way, there's a bit of me that thinks that cars like the Z8 um, are appreciated by people who judge a car as a, as a package and not just a visual, not just a visual thing. They're cars for car people and not people that buy cars to look good or be seen in. Because I think this car creates a lot of confusion. A lot of people didn't know the Z8 existed. A lot of people are staring at it today, I suspect thinking that it's just a modified Z3.
I think there's a lot of people who who understand this car and appreciate this car, like the McLaren F1. I don't actually think the McLaren F1 is an attractive car. I never have done. What attracts me to the McLaren F1 is the, the engineering and the packaging, what it can do, and the fact that it was born out of that obsession, the Gordon Murray obsession. And this has that, you can tell the engineering obsession about it. It's, it's quirky in places for the, for the sake of being quirky, but that, that's great. But when, it, when it's all said and done, it's a car which drives really well and feels exceptionally well put together. And that car that's just gone past the other way, the BMW iX. We're living now in a world where BMW can't seem to, or won't seem to build cars that are handsome. They're trying to be disruptive in a, in a fugly way. Why? Why do it? Whilst I'm driving this, I would like you, the viewers, to tell me in the comments which of Tony's other cars would you have liked to have driven? If you haven't seen his car cave, of which this is one of them, I'll put a link on the screen above my head now. You must watch that. Hard to believe, you know, looking at this thing. Maybe this was Chris Bangle's genius at BMW. Is the cars don't seem to have aged because they were so ahead of their time when they came out. We, we didn't fully understand them. I don't think I fully understood this. And production of this ended 20 years ago. Ended. Does it look over 20 years old? I don't think so. I do not think so. So I finally got behind the wheel of a Z8 all these years after it, after it was made. The inner Brosnan in me is now satisfied. I'm not being chased by a helicopter with a circular saw on it. No, I'm actually being chased by a Passat CC. It's not quite as daunting. I've been trying to think of like how to sum the Z8 up and I think it's like an album, a music album that's a grower. It doesn't shout at you initially, it's not too loud, it's not too gary, it's not too much of a showman, but every time you feel it or look at it and you experience it, the love and the appreciation builds and it builds and you keep going, yeah, actually that's really interesting and yeah, that feels really good and yeah. And I was talking to Tony about it and he agrees. It's one of those things you keep coming back to and you keep going, yeah, there's something about this. There's something about this that I hadn't worked out until now. And 20 years after production has ended on the Z8, I think finally it's clicking, but it, it makes a big difference being fortunate enough to experience one. I want to say thank you very much to Tony for letting me do that. The only disappointment, frankly, is I can't get all of you to experience this car firsthand because I think that's when you finally understand what on earth this quirky, classy beast is all about really. And it actually isn't a beast. It's more of a sort of suave gent. Anyway, I hope you've really enjoyed this episode of The Late Break Show. If you haven't already seen the car cave that this car lives within, Tony's Garages, I'll put a link on the screen now for it. That's assuming it's come out yet. Also, maybe you want to subscribe. Maybe you want to become a Patreon, and I'll put the details of those things in the description, as well as our new uh, e-shop. You can buy merchandise from The Late Break Show. Go and have a look. Thank you.